Yeah, obviously our season is concluded, and I want to first and foremost thank um, all of our players, our staff, um, our ownership, our front office, you know, for the commitment that they uh, provided to trying to figure out a way to navigate this COVID environment, you know, and and deal with a, you know, a lot of unique circumstances, you know, Clearly, in many cases, whether it's staff or or players, especially, or some of the support travel party, you know that meant you know being disconnected from families uh, in most cases, and um, you know so that was obviously a very uh, uh, unique circumstance, which took a lot of sacrifice um, and commitment. And so I also want to really give a, a major shout out to Zach Britton, who obviously had the. Uh, higher level of responsibilities to to act as our player rep and the go-between between our you know ownership and front office on behalf of his union and his teammates and and at times that obviously you know was really a difficult position I'm sure to be in and so um, again I just want to uh, thank all parties involved for trying to find a way to 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 make a very unique circumstance work and and I fall back to of always being in a position of appreciation that we were uh, in the position to have work, you know, during uh, uh, obviously a pandemic that has, you know, wreaked havoc all across the world and when many people couldn't. So I just wanted to start this off by not forgetting um, the level of commitment uh, all those parties uh, had in this process. And with that, uh, certainly open up the questions and, and Jason, take it away. Okay, thanks, Cash. We can start with Meredith. Please unmute. Hey, Brian. Aaron just made the comment that he thinks it's important for people to realize how close the team is to winning a World Series. With the amount of talent you had on the roster, why do you think you weren't able to achieve that goal? Well, I mean, uh, ultimately we ran up against the team that was better. Uh, Tampa Bay uh, proved out during the regular season that they uh, – they were in the right to be American League Eastern Division champions. We had a chance to change that narrative potentially in a, in a short season, postseason uh, appearance, and it didn't work out that way either. So they proved um, in the marathon of 60 games that they were better, and then they proved in the sprint of, uh, of the division series uh, that they were better. Um, so uh, I think we had a championship caliber uh, team, um, but uh, that's, that's the level of, uh, I guess, praise I can put on it uh, for us all is that we you know, obviously earned a postseason right and, uh, and got past Cleveland and, and ran into a five game set that uh, took us out. And uh, I just feel like in the end, that the, and with, you know, the, the, when the dust settles, they're a better franchise right now than we are. A lot has been made about that game two decision to essentially use Davey as an opener followed by Jay Happ. How much input did you have into that decision and did you ultimately agree with the way Aaron Boone decided to go there? Yeah, no, I agree with the, uh, I thought it was, again, we instituted our process that we've had in place now for feels like well over a decade um, where everybody's going to have their say and suggestions for the manager to filter and and that's our process and then ultimately uh, you know we try to find a way or suggested ways of hey you can climb this mountain this way you can climb this mountain that way um, you know or you can go basically what all the routes to try to get to the top of the mountain which would be to victory and then in the end you know Aaron will decide with his staff what route he's most comfortable taking and what makes the most sense for him and uh, and that's the way it, it's always been and um, so certainly involved making sure my job uh, as general manager and director of baseball ops essentially would be to make sure that we stay true to a, having a strong process and make sure that all lines of information um, that is real uh, and accurate uh, flows and then obviously be in a position to have a strong process that if there's some fool's gold that gets thrown one way or the other that that actually can you know be revealed over the course of time too. So it puts the manager in the best position possible to, to plot a course, whether it's lineup related, whether it's how he'll use his bullpen, how he'll line up his starters. Um, but uh, but I know there's that narrative. It's been asked several times about you know, the manager being a puppet and all that. None of that's true. I've never uh, ordered a manager to do anything specifically. Um, and you know, Aaron would be able to testify to that as will Joe Girardi and Joe Torrey. They've never been directed at any time by me or our front office to do something that they didn't want to do. And um, simple as that, but I know I've said that before and 
you know, uh, people want to believe whatever they want to believe. So um, I just know we have a good, strong, healthy, sound process uh, and one that we're proud of. Take another from Bruce Beck. Cash, uh, how do you get over the hump from, from being close to winning it all since the Yankees always talk about the championship versus just making the playoffs? That's always been your, your mantra, so to speak. Well, to be a true champion, you got to play uh, you know, your best baseball when it counts in October. First, you got to earn the right to get there, which obviously we've been able to do for quite some time. And then, uh, and then navigate October against some really – amazing opponents and um and that means bringing your best your a game at all times and and uh, we clearly were able to do that to some degree in the cleveland series and and i think if you evaluate the performance levels whether it's our hitters or uh, various pitchers in the uh division series against tampa bay that didn't happen and um and that's obviously a big reason why we're home and you know so essentially try to put yourself in a position to to compete in october and then take your shot and it's a prize fight uh, to be quite honest, every series is a prize fight that you happen to advance to. And, and the truth of the matter is, you know, you're going to have someone who's going to be standing at the end of that fight. We went five games with, uh, with the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, and, you know, the loser gets knocked out. And, you know, all the blood and the, uh, and, you know, that comes with that knockout comes our way, which is also criticism for not being good enough. Um, and so, you know, I know that comes with the territory of playing meaningful games in October. Our fans, our ownership, our front office, our players, our staff, we all care about the, you know, the end result. Uh, that's why we're in this arena competing for it. And um, so uh, now, obviously, when you lose, you get dissected. Um, and, you know, that's also part of this process. And I get that. I've been around long enough to deal with it and understand it. And, and uh, you know, it's as simple as that. So ultimately, we'll do what we always try to do, which is evaluate uh, all aspects of this roster, um, what's coming, what's available in play, what the financial circumstances exist in real time at that time. Uh, and you know, uh, those conversations will begin, obviously, a little sooner than we wanted, uh, engage ownership about the realities of, of today and, and come up with uh, you know, the best game plan possible to move forward with uh, with hopefully the best talented roster we can put forth and, and get back at it again for next year. Yeah. Take another from Pete Caldera. Brian, um, how do you evaluate your catching situation right now? And would you even envision uh, a competition between Higashioka and Sanchez if, if those are your two primary catchers going into spring training next year? Well, I think it's it's certainly a fair question. Obviously, the way uh, Gary Sanchez's season, uh, you know, transpired, and then the way it ended with Higashioka actually starting, uh, you know, in the postseason as many games as he did, um, I think it's one of the discussion points we're going to have to focus on. Um, you know, obviously, this COVID season was unique. You saw a lot of um, unexpected performances throughout both leagues uh, from players that you know, obviously are capable of more. Uh, we have to determine whether this was a byproduct of, of unique circumstances or more a reflection of, of what is, you know, to be expected as we move forward. So we have to have those legitimate discussions that haven't happened yet. I know Gary Sanchez is an extremely talented player. Um, you know, I know in the offensive side there was, you know, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, I would describe it as, you know, I think he, he swung the bat better than those numbers look, um, you know, and uh, on the defensive side, I know he was fully committed to Tanner Swanson and adjusting uh, to Tanner Swanson's um, you know, mechanical adjustments that would improve his uh, receiving skills, which I think did happen. Um, but ultimately the end result was uh, the performance wasn't Gary Sanchez uh, caliber and, and that obviously allowed Higashioka to, to come in and do what he did and, and kind of take control towards the end. So uh, we'll evaluate, you know, those, you know, uh, that particular position because we'll be forced to now as we move forward. And, and so that'll be for another day. And you know, I'm not here to, to tell you, you know, uh, I, haven't I haven't even talked to Aaron Boone what his thoughts are yet. We haven't had any meetings with our pro scouting department yet. Uh, we'll start to schedule them maybe as early as next week. I don't know. Uh, but, uh, but ultimately that will be a subject that we have to discuss as well. And it could, 
could very well be a change. It could very well be a competition. Could very well be other. I, I don't know because we haven't had those conversations. But I know Gary's, you know, capable of a lot. Uh, there's no question in my mind about that. But uh, I'm sure he's as disappointed in this season as uh, as anybody. But I know he cares and he's committed. Um, and uh, his his career will continue, no question about it. And and better days would be ahead for him. Uh, I truly believe that. Thanks. Marley Rivera, you have the next question. Um, hi, Cash. When you have the highest payroll in baseball, uh, being eliminated in the postseason by a team with one of the lowest, um, how do you explain that to fans who are obviously angry out there? Uh, I, I don't think it's a payroll comparison in any way, shape, or form. So, again, if, if you strategically follow how the Rays have built their franchise, it's not something that just occurred with our payroll versus their payroll in the last year. You know, they. Uh, I think for, first, if I – and I don't think I did, so I want to congratulate the Tampa Bay Rays um, and Eric Neander for, and Kevin Cash for obviously what they've accomplished thus far and, and, and hopefully for what they're about to accomplish uh, as they move forward and try to, to do something that uh, we were not capable of in 2020. Um, but falling back, they've got to this level not by, you know, some short-term decision-making process. It's, it's been building over the course of time, obviously having uh, early on when they weren't as good and their record wasn't as great, uh, you know, cashing in on a lot of draft picks and international money and spending it wisely and developing it properly and then making really astute trades like the one they did with Pittsburgh uh, to add to their talent level. And so uh, this is no surprise that Tampa Bay is formidable. This is no surprise that Tampa Bay is in the position to compete for a world championship title. Uh, this hasn't snuck up on anybody that's been paying attention throughout you know, the industry. Um, you know, I know last year there was a lot of narrative about the Yankees versus Red Sox, who's going to win the East. And I know privately uh, amongst others, maybe publicly, I can't remember now, telling whether it was our ownership or everybody else, hey, the Rays, no one's mentioning the Rays. No one's, this team is coming. And now they're here. Um, and so, uh, and you see that, that's part of the process. So it's not, it's not in a simple form, uh, their payroll versus our payroll. I think ultimately uh, they're forced to operate a certain way based on the market they're in and we're, uh, uh, permitted to operate a different way because the market we happen to be in and both ways can have success. Um, and both ways, obviously, uh, you know, we've seen success and, and, and that will continue as we move forward. So uh, I think that's a more simplistic form of, you know, if you look at a long-term process that transpired over the course of time in Tampa Bay, they were very committed to it and they're now paying, now they're receiving the dividends of their, Patience, hard work, commitment to their process, uh, and that's happened over the course of time, not in the last year, not in the last two years, but in the last you know, five years, I'd say, or six years, that's you know, coming to fruition. And so it's something to be very proud of if you're a Rays fan and if you're Eric Neander and their ownership group and Kevin Cash uh, and their players. And so uh, you know, let's see what happens the rest of the postseason for them. And, and um, you know, when you get knocked out, you, you, you'd like to be knocked out by the ultimate world champion, you know. And uh, so I'm hoping that Tampa can go on and, and uh, do right by that fan base and, and, uh, and finish the job. But obviously they have more work to do in the, in the ALCS first. I apologize. Just a quick uh, follow up. So is it more difficult than like just entirely? I understand your explanation and obviously it's true, but is it more di difficult when your executive team approved by ownership? You know, you spend so much money the last couple of years and this is the team that beats you. No. No, I don't have any. Uh, um, there's I, my head's not going to lay low if you get beat by a team that's that's worthy. And Tampa Bay was worthy. They they had uh, they have a tremendous starting rotation. They have a tremendous bullpen. They have a Swiss Army knife offense that they designed uh, in a way that they can match up with anybody. And so their you know defense is really good. So they're they're really you know and not just them. There was a number of teams in this postseason you would look at and you'd say you have a lot of respect from afar for how they go about their business and what they do. And um, and so do I want us to be the best? version of ourselves? The answer is yes. Am I proud of being in a position to compete for a championship? The answer is yes. Am I massively disappointed uh, and sorry that we we're unable to finish the job? Uh, the answer to that is yes. But, uh, but, you know, I respect, you know, a great baseball team and they're proving to be a great baseball team. And, um, and so I think you could be both disappointed and devastated as we are, but at the same time, 
tip your cap to the opponent who did that to you at the same time. I, I, you know, I, I feel like um, we had players that cared, that were committed, that uh, did some amazing things and, ha and have a lot of talent, and they went up against a team that was extremely talented, and and uh, and we went five games and in a very tight contest late in game five. Uh, again, that's when the knockout blow hit and took us down. Um, but, you know, we had our opportunities uh, with some really amazing players that uh, we're proud to have and been called Yankees. And, uh, and you know, we'll see where the future takes us. I mean, again, we're back to the drawing board. Uh, but, you know, uh, I don't think it's as simple as, you know, uh, you know, I don't think it's just, just as simple as, uh, you know, trying to, you know, explain away why our payroll is where it is and why their payroll is where that is. It's just when you're competing on the field, regular season and postseason and season, it's the, your, your payroll is not going to win it for you. Your the talent that you have in front of you at the time and and how they happen to perform on any given day is what's going to be the difference maker. Yeah, they're still players. They're still human beings. Sweeney Murdy, you have the next question. Brian, along those lines, um, payroll, regardless of payroll, the Rays seem to have a roster that has a lot of flexibility and versatility built into it. And you have a roster that at times feels logged in in certain spots. Do you feel like you need a little bit more of that versatility, whether it's players who play multiple places, more of a left-right balance, or do you think putting out a roster similar to what you've done the last couple of years and just hoping for a different result is, is more of what you're after? Well, I think we obviously want to be the best we can possibly be, but that's based on what we already have at the same time. So, um, you know, so I, whether you signed a DJ, DJ LeMayhew to be that versatile everyday guy that can play first, second, and third would be a manifestation of a choice we actually made, you know, what, two years ago, you know, to try to buy some flexibility and versatility. But every decision you have is, you know, uh, so I know in a, earlier conversation with our manager, the question was posed about, are we too right-handed? Of course, you'd like to have the balance if you can, but then when you're faced with a decision of, do I remove, you know, do I do I not try to re-sign DJ LeMay who, because he's right-handed so I can get a left-handed bat in there? It's okay to have those conversations, you know, uh, if you so choose, or, or, or do it like last year, do I trade Luke Voigt because he's right-handed uh, to try to get a left-handed hitting first baseman in there? Um, again, you know, those are conversations that are fair game to always have and decipher. But it, again, to pull the trigger on making decisions like that, you know, uh, you have to come up with, A, the ability to secure the alternative, and then, B, feel like you're actually better. This is going to make us better because you, we have a very talented player or players that you're trying to reconfigure so those steps you got to take very lightly and uh because ultimately you're subtracting from one area which is a strength uh and trying to improve an area some other way by gaining the balance and so i don't know if those choices really manifest itself as easily as maybe people would think that it's not just automatically a wave a magic wand and and that'll disappear and this will reappear you know you, you engage all markets available and evaluate what you currently have, which we actually believe is really good. Um, and so when we make this tough decisions, which we've done before, um, you know, we've you know, clearly have fallen back to what we've currently got because we believe that's better than the alternative of what we could have done differently. Um, but in its own vacuum, would you like more balance? Of course you'd like more balance. Would you like more, you know, uh, uh, of any aspect of it that can improve your roster? And the answer is yes. Would I like to have stayed healthy, you know, where Seve or, or Herman wasn't suspended for two postseasons or Paxton didn't have a setback towards September that pushed him into the World Series if we got there? The answer is yes to all those things. But it's just not how it, the, the mechanics actually work as easily as that. I guess, would you, would you have to maybe seek that type of balance out more when it clearly works over the course of 162 but hasn't seemed to work for you over the course of short series. Instead, but I'm not sure in terms of seeking the balance, how and when, you know, uh, the balance, you know, so, so if you're in the draft, uh, if we're predominantly right-handed, do you avoid drafting Aaron Judge because he's right-handed? The answer is no, you draft the best talent and you let it develop. And then when your talent's developing over the course of time, we happen to be very right-handed right now because of the amount of talent, you know, we navigated or uh, gravitated to LeMayhew and his free agency 
despite being right-handed. It, because we were so right-handed, we didn't shy away from it. We actually decided still to go all in because it still checked in so many boxes. So again, I think in a vacuum, yes, you'd like to get as much balance as you can, but in terms of where your system is, how your international talent from the draft and international signings develop over the course of time, what trades you actually make that you believe you're getting better at by making, by securing more talent, if it happens to be predominantly more right-handed and the left-handed choices don't really manifest itself, then you go with what you've got and you embrace it. And uh, again, you try to be better in other areas too. And and uh, because ultimately your offense, your defense, um, your starting rotation and your bullpen collectively is going to have to get the job done one way or the other. And sometimes threading that needle uh, of getting, you know, a specific area balanced out or, or, you know, it's not as easy said than done. Uh, and, Please don't take these as excuses. I'm just trying to explain the, you know, the landscape that you walk through every time. So ultimately we have a championship contending roster. I believe that is a fact. We're not going to be able to call ourselves champions. That is also a fact. And so we'll continue to find a way to, to improve upon the roster and on every year that opportunities change based on budgets opportunities change based on the free agent choices based on your free agent losses based on the trade opportunities that exists and how you your system is developing and where it sits at the time frame too and so um we'll have to we'll be obviously going through all that again dan martin please unmute hey brian uh, do you anticipate making any uh moves on the coaching staff and do you foresee labor as your shortstop moving forward or is that a conversation that you might need to have about perhaps moving him back to second base uh in terms of our coaching staff uh i don't anticipate any changes in our coaching staff although i haven't had any conversations with ownership uh on any of that i think ultimately uh uh hal steinbrenner deserves to have what he always you know demands which is a sit down uh, with myself and any of other parties that he wants uh, to discuss the uh, and dissect the 2020 season, um, and then uh, and then also obviously at the same time we'll map out how we handle navigating the 2021 program. Um, so from my perspective, to answer your question honestly, I don't anticipate any changes, um, and uh, and you know if changes do come, I would think it uh, you know it would be something that would come from you know some other influence which i i don't anticipate but i also can't ignore either because in fairness i haven't had conversations with hal steinberg about things of that specificity uh in terms of labor is our shortstop moving forward or not we're going to evaluate all uh circumstances that best fit us he's currently our shortstop the answer to that question is yes i think he's uh capable of of better defense in this young early year uh, of his career, not year, but uh, of his career. Uh, and uh, we will, again, game plan, discuss with all parties involved. And if we feel something is uh, a better way to go, then obviously we'll discuss that. But as of right now, whatever we currently have that we're controlled is what is our best option. And, uh, and if suggestions come our way from pro scouting or analytics um, or development uh, or our uh, field manager and immediate coaching staff, then we'll evaluate those as the process would warrant. Thanks. Brian Hope, go ahead. You have the next question. Hey, Cash. Uh, Hal was on the radio yesterday. He said that you guys have lost more money than any other team this year because of the COVID and not having fans. So where does that put you as you approach free agency, guys like LeMahieu, Tanaka? What situation are you in? Well, obviously, I think this global pandemic has affected everybody in a horrific way in a business setting. So, um, you know, I, clearly he's he's just shining a light on the reality that I don't think would be a surprise to anybody um, or shouldn't be. Uh, but again, I haven't had conversations uh, directly with Hal Steinbrenner about, you know, um, how it affects our decision making moving forward. But clearly these are real constraints that exist uh, throughout all industries and, and households alone. And, and so, you know, it'll be something that clearly will factor into how we approach, you know, the future. 
And then uh, Boone said that LeMahieu is at Yankee Stadium today. Did you cross paths with him at all? Did you have any conversation about what's ahead? I did not. I've been in the clubhouse, but I did not see DJ LeMahieu. So he might have, you know, again, we have a big footprint underneath there. So I was in I was in our coaching area, our training room, and um, in uh, Aaron Boone's office. But I did not go into the players' area. So. Okay, thank you. Take another from Brendan Cuddy. Cash, can you go into next year expecting or hoping that John Carlos Stanton can play any outfield for you guys, or do you see him as a DH option only going forward? I think, uh, given the you know uh, the injuries that we've experienced with him thus far, I think the safe bet would be to to you know focus with him at the DH level. Um, you know, I don't think he's not capable of playing the outfield. He's very athletic and and can clearly handle that position. The workload and maintaining his, you know, lower body injuries obviously would be something that would be at risk. So I, I would think that uh, our best strategy um, would be to deploy him on an everyday basis at the DH role like we've been doing. Um, notwithstanding, though, I, I know that the new protocols uh, with the Eric Cressy team that he's gravitated to and, and feels very good about from – from uh, his position moving forward might and hopefully help him uh, maintain, you know, uh, a better health standard. But, but given where, what we've lived through thus far, I think our intent is to try to keep him as healthy as much as we possibly can, because, you know, just as postseason alone, you saw what he is capable of doing. He always seems to hit when he's healthy and, uh, and he hits, you know, all types of pitching. And, and so he's a formidable, uh, offensive weapon that we'd love to keep active uh, throughout. And so the DH role is probably best suited for that. Yesterday, Hal said he'd have to talk with his family about whether to bring back Domingo Herman, about whether they're okay with, you know, or if he's, if Domingo has uh, shown that he's progressed past whatever happened. Are you expecting Domingo back with the team next year? Well, I think uh, probably what Hal's also talking to is the fact that because he was suspended, you know, and be especially on top of the COVID pandemic. I know he made several requests to work out, uh, you know, whether it was in the Dominican, whether it was in Tampa, and we weren't permitted by the suspension rules and the COVID rules to allow, unless you're rehabbing an injured player, which he wasn't injured. So we have not had our hands on him, you know, uh, by uh, a number of different restrictions. So we haven't had access to this player. Uh, and so, you know, clearly this winter now that he's off the suspension uh, and when things can ease up, uh, we are obviously looking forward to reengaging, you know, uh, Domingo Herman and, and getting a sense of where he's at, uh, both in a personal uh, as well as professional uh, light. And so we certainly hope all is well with him and his family. Um, but, you know, that is a, you know, uh, an evolving situation, uh, which I, sounds like that's what Hal was speaking to yesterday. James Wagner, please unmute. Hey, guys, just going back to something that Brian asked you about the finances of this year. I mean, obviously, you spend like a record contract on, you know, Garrett Cole last offseason. Would it be unrealistic just even looking now uh, for you to behave again that way, given, you know, the, the financial situation of, of your team? And then also broadly in baseball, too, like what, what do you even think the market like would look like given – that money was such a real concern for you and, and, and everyone across the sport this year. Well, I'm sure by rule, I'm prohibited from from speculating, talking to whatever our financial you know issues are aren't. I think there's an acknowledgement that clearly, like every business entity around the land, uh, you know, things are not the same. Um, how we choose to navigate uh, the the immediate present and therefore the future. Um, remains to be seen, and I don't think I'm permitted to telegraph what what that happens to be, and, and certainly don't. I'm not even in a position to do so because I haven't had those heavy lifting conversations uh, with uh, the most important person in that process, which is our owner, Hal Steinbrenner, and his family. So, um, you know, I guess it's a to be continued. Uh, I'd like to, you know, I know we have a lot of talent currently existing on this roster already that we control as we move forward, and I also know that. Uh, we have some players on the uh, injured list that uh, we look forward to getting back, uh, you know, that we were obviously not able to access here in the 2020 season. But, you know, obviously we certainly 
uh, are dreaming on reaccessing those talents uh, as we move forward in 2021 because I think they can play a really big role for us. So uh, what more on top of that we will do, can do, uh, I think there's a lot of discussions that have to ha be had here between now and, you know, um, the conclusion of the winter program. So we'll see how it is. We'll see what's available via the trade market. We'll see what uh, we might be willing to trade uh, and we'll see what type of flexibility our payroll will provide or won't provide. Um, but I, I'd like to think that regardless of all that being said just now, I won't be telegraphing what it is uh, because I think by rule I'm not allowed to and it's probably just not in our interest to do so either way. Lindsay Adler, please unmute. Hey, Cash. Um, Aaron Boone came into this organization as one of the most well-known kind of baseball lifers. I'm curious, after three years with him at the helm, what do you feel that your organization has learned from him and his experience and perspective? Well, I think he's honored, uh, you know, who he is every step of the way. I think he's a real approachable person. Uh, that connects well with his players, connects well with uh, his coworkers, whether it's his, you know, uh, coaching staff, his support staff, uh, his front office, um, you know, our fans. I think he, what I've learned from him is he's a very patient, a very uh, approachable, very open-minded uh, individual, extremely intelligent, um, that that is willing to put the work in uh, to try to decipher the the right next move and the best position to be sitting in and, and then live with the results, um, you know, for better or for worse. So, you know, all I continue to see from, from Aaron Boone, the person is, is everything that I thought I felt from that interview process, as well as our entire team was, uh, he's, you know, made that real. He's exact, you know, uh, he's exactly who he is with you in the media. Uh, he is with us, uh, and that's a that's a tremendous skill to be the same person um, to all parties involved, whether it's the media covering the game, whether it's our fans, whether it's our players, whether it's the sports staff, whether it's a pitching coach, hitting coach, uh, opposing uh, team, you know, ownership, front office. He he just happens to be, you know, really cool, calm, and collected. But obviously, you see him snap dragging every now and then when uh, when he disagreed with a call on the field, but. But otherwise, a uh, very patient hand with uh, uh, a growth mentality and an open mindedness, which is something I really do appreciate. And we've asked a lot about the, you know, the relationship between the analytics and the front office and the coaching staff. I'm curious, how often have you seen Aaron push back, um, you know, on some decisions that maybe you guys might have brought to him, that maybe his coaching staff might have brought to him? And what does it look like when he does that? Um, does he push back? The answer is yes. Does he, does just like, again, I use my, I've been around a long time now, whether it's a Joe Torrey, whether it's a Joe Girardi or an Aaron Boone, not every manager has agreed with suggestions made and, but yet every manager was allowed to plot their own course, even with a disagreement. So, um, I think there is a healthy debate that transpires and then a, and an all in commitment once that decision is ultimately made. And in, in terms of the lineup card and the in-game strategies, those are the managers. And it's always has been. And uh, as long as I'm the general manager, it never will be different. Um, and so what's it look like? Uh, it's a healthy discord uh, where, you know, ultimately the process is going to play out in a way that he's going to have his reasonings, he's going to share them, and then it's my responsibility to accept those and appreciate the fact that he did the dissection, he took the time and the case, uh, the patients and the care to really evaluate all aspects of it. And then, and then we commit, you know, this is what he wants to do, even though it might be something that I thought we should go a different way. So be it. He's got my support. Um, and he knows I have, you know, his support, uh, but you know, in full transparency, you know, um, Again, I reiterate that in the end of the day, the manager's job is to, to play the players he thinks are the best served to help him win that game uh, and deploy the strategies that he thinks with his staff is going to help him the best. I would describe our coaching staff as, as a, an eclectic crew of old school and new school who he turns to for guidance every step of the way. Um, 
And yeah, you know, I am a little surprised, to be quite honest, about the the uh, constant current dialogue about the analytics involvement. As you see, a number of really successful operations currently playing out in postseason, and they're used to being there on a year-in and year-out basis on a consistent level, that deploy the exact same methodology that we do. But yet, we're not. I guess we're being questioned on we're doing it, uh, but. It's okay for them to do it. It's just a weapon uh, to deploy to make sure that you're maximizing all advantages. Uh, and that's all we've done. And I'm not ashamed of it. I'm proud of the fact that we're using every tool in the toolbox. It's made us better. It's allowed us to be a consistent contender. Um, but I, at the same time, I do accept the criticism, criticisms that come when you lose because then that invites where could you have done something different? Where can you be better? Uh, where did you go wrong? And Objectively, we have to current. We always have to evaluate that aspect of it too, and accept the fact that all right, um, is there any areas that we need to improve upon? And and we'll clearly do that regardless. Um, but I do consider our process really strong, very healthy, uh, collaborative in terms of making sure all the information gets flown in uh, and provided, and then ultimately puts our manager and our pitching coach or hitting coach and, and the rest of his staff in a position to make very difficult decisions to pick and choose based on the, the players and the personnel and, and their mentalities of what's the best uh, decision to go with and, uh, and then live with those results. Christy Ackert, please unmute. Hey, Brian. Um, Aaron said that he didn't know of any um, players that might need off-season uh, surgery or anything. I just wanted to check with you to see if there was any update on Luke Voigt. And I think Gio Urshela said there's a possibility of having to have his elbow cleaned out. Um, in Luke Voigt's case, he saw Dr. Christopher Ahmad, and then he had a follow-up with Dr. Uh, O'Malley from HSS. Both doctors evaluated uh, uh, his foot which was plantar fasciitis the same way. Uh, and uh, a PRP injection was uh, directed and has happened. Uh, and he'll be in a Cam Walker boot for a week. And they expect and hope that that will resolve the issue. Um, and so, uh, you know, there was some a medical intervention, obviously, with the injection of the PRP. But nothing more is expected than that at this time. Uh, and both doctors felt that this was the route to go and, and it should suffice. Uh, in terms of Gio Urshela, he was evaluated by Dr. Christopher Ahmad, finished the season asymptomatic, uh, and no surgery has been recommended at this stage. And uh, no follow up second opinions have been recommended either. So he's going to return home to Columbia, and, uh, and you know, we look forward to seeing him in spring training. If something changes on that, I'll let you know, but that's the current uh, landscape. There's no other uh, pending surgeries or, or uh, surgical in interventions that are anticipated or expected unless we have some sort of new complaints that uh, arise that sometimes happen over the course of winter training. And Louis, uh, Severino is expected back for spring training next year? No, his, uh, his I mean, yeah, he had Tommy John, obviously, towards the end of spring training. Normally, those are longer than 12 months, so uh, so I would... I don't know what the proper date would be, but is it June? Uh, okay. I think throwing dates out like or months out like probably June is a safe safe way to go. Maybe it's July. If it's sooner, so be it. But his Tommy John, his uh, rehab is going well. I think he's three weeks into his, it might be 90 feet flat ground right now. Um, it's going as well as could be expected at this early juncture, but obviously he's got a lot of road to clear and and then there'll be a shutdown period why uh why he recovers again in this process so all those things are to be determined but but normally it seems like tommy john now is the days are anywhere from 14 to 15 months sometimes and so uh so i gotta give myself and therefore our fans a little bit of a uh uh safety rails in terms of expectation of when would be the appropriate time to to expect him to be reintroduced to the major league club so that's fair just one final question um player development was you know, put on hold this year. What are your plans for your minor leaguers so that they don't lose a whole year of development? Well, obviously there's no leagues. Uh, currently, winter balls will be existing in, in some uh, countries. And so uh, some players will play winter ball um, and uh, we will do as much remote coaching as we possibly can. Um, despite COVID obviously spiking throughout the country, it seems like now, but we, uh, um, you know, we're not going to have an instructional league, uh, and our plans are to deploy uh, our coaches throughout the country and, and stay connected, whether it's remote or in person, on an individual basis throughout the wintertime. 
Thank you. I'm going to take a handful more. Bradford Davis, please unmute. Hey, uh, Brian. Uh, you know, there was a situation earlier um, this, this season where a couple of your minor leaguers expressed like public frustration with the team's apparent silence about uh, the situation with Jacob Blake. I'm curious if you have any, um, you know, if, if you were aware, aware of that or, or uh, can share anything that's developed since then. I met with those players directly um, and uh, and I I went over and met with our players uh in at the yankee complex at that time it was reported uh i sat with them with our uh, player development director kevin reese and uh as well as eric schmidt and we had a chance to you know have a uh, uh a conversation about what they were feeling why they were feeling what they were looking for from the yankees and uh, I promised them that all that information was going to be shared all the way to the top, which it was, and incorporated in our statements and our actions moving forward. Uh, and uh, I know they appreciated that. And um, so if you, that's what you're speaking to, that, that something turning the clock back, uh, which has obviously been a very difficult time that which will continue and does continue, um, you know, is what we did. In the meantime, we've, uh, you know, we've continued to, uh, to work towards uh, improving, you know, uh, our present and our future with, with uh, I think Hal Steinbrenner and through Brian Smith is creating a, a, uh, a team of personnel to help guide, dissect, look inward to find higher ground to make sure that we're handling this in the best way possible, not just at the major league level, but at the minor league level and all aspects of our department and something that, uh, again, to make, uh, I think the intent of ownership always is to make sure that this is a place at all. Uh, people can come and work and be proud to be working for and working at in a place that's a, uh, a great opportunity for all reasons. And so, um, so if there's parts that that haven't been as good as it can be, we're going to do everything in our power to make them better. And um, so, I think uh, we have started a lot of heavy lifting there and, and inward reflection, uh, and that will continue. And that that's with the engagement of our major league players, our minor league players, but not just that, our our uh, black employees that that don't happen to put a uniform on and you know it's our support staff and other various departments that are in the business side or uh whether it's tickets or or finance or marketing or what have you and make sure that you know, all the information and input that's necessary for us to react to that we're receiving in real time take another from bob clappish hey brian just just a quick question i'm just wondering how sick you are of, of doing this this post-mortem conference press conference for the third year in a row and you know emotionally um how much does it eat at you to to come up short well first you know um i'd rather be doing this than not making the playoffs first and foremost i'd rather be in a position I, we're playing meaningful games in october and i am not going to uh shy away from how important that is at the very least just because we're here doesn't guarantee anything. Just because we have the highest payroll uh, doesn't guarantee us anything. Um, but making sure that we're in a position to believe we're capable of winning a championship, and even believing that doesn't guarantee it. It's just, hey, you've got to put yourself in a position to, to take a shot and then, uh, and then live, with the, live with those results. If I, if I, you know, if I wasn't up for having the, uh, this dialogue now with you, for instance, Bob Clappish, and answering uh, a question like this, then then I don't belong in this job. You know, I don't. You know, I don't. Uh, I, I could. I should just do something else. But I am willing to walk through fire to 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 accomplish something great, even though only one team every year can do so. And uh, and so, I know that we're proud of the fact that we have a shot, uh, that we've been in a position to take a shot. Uh, we've had opportunities that. That if we took advantage of, and you know, maybe in the game played out a different way, whether whether it's running and scoring positions or getting that final out in a, in a, a crucial time, or uh, or making the great defensive play, which has also happened against us. I mean, I like you sit and you sit in the wrestle and you toss and turn about, and remember plays that the opposing teams made that like, wow, that's a hit right off the bat, and all of a sudden it was a great diving play by the third baseman that converted the out that prevented the inning from going, uh, uh, which would have extended things for us and changed maybe the ultimate outcome. You, you play all those different games, but ultimately we are have been in the arena uh, to compete with some obviously extremely talented teams on the other end, and some of them we've navigated past, and other ones we haven't, and uh, that's just the way the 
uh, the October postseason works. I know that Aaron Boone used the word cruel. It's a cruel ending for those who don't, you know, obviously get there uh, all the way to the final uh, podium uh, to be that last team standing. But uh, but I'm proud to be in the arena fighting to be that last team standing. And, and, you know, now the job is to get back there again next year and take another shot. And we're, listen, I mean, I'm seeing the Dodgers right now. They got eight straight division titles in the National League West. They're considered the, the you know, one of the prime, you know, examples of a greatly run franchise, a terrifically run franchise. I have tremendous players, talent, um, you know, uh, strong process, and but it doesn't guarantee the outcome. You know, it doesn't guarantee uh, any end result. It just, you know, they, they're taking their shot uh, and, you know, and other teams as well. So I'm proud to be in this arena. Uh, I hope to be in a position to ultimately say, you know, we are world champions again sooner than later, but my words won't make that happen. You know, ultimately, the collective efforts of all parties involved from from top to bottom, including through our players, that's going to be the end result. And, uh, and you know, so, you know, we'll just keep fighting. And that's all I can tell you. I mean, the commitment of trying to be a champion is always going to be there and we'll continue to try. And, and, uh, and I'm proud of that championship caliber intent and interest and effort and um, but I can't guarantee an outcome, you know, uh, and, you know, so at the end of the day, you know, uh, we'll keep working at it. I promise you. Uh, that's our commitment to our fans. Am I sorry that we lost, uh, obviously, and didn't provide, uh, you know, new memories of championship glory for our fans as early as 2020? Of course I am. You know, that's something that that uh, that we want for our fans more than anything. Um, but, uh, but that quest continues. Um, and. That's all I can say. Thanks, Brian. Joel Sherman, you have the next question. Um, Cash, uh, as the person who's going to have to ultimately make this decision, after you meet with your people, your analytics, your scouts, you do all that in those meetings, how do you determine that you've been so close now for straight years that you're still on the right path as opposed to that maybe you do need to do some kind of shuffle uh, this offseason to change the cards in some way to have a product that could get through? Well, I think every year we, sh we shuffle it up. Every year it's a little different, it seems. Um, and again, it depends on the personnel you currently have and the commitment levels you got with them as well as the available choices at hand in front of you, uh, coupled with co budget constraints, coupled with what's coming through the system. So, you know, I kind of feel like I tried to walk through that earlier. You know, um, you know so there's you know, now next year, uh, there's the possibility of having a Severino return to play. There's a possibility of having, and these are the controllable pieces, having, you know, potentially Domingo Herman return, uh, the possibility of a Debbie Garcia now, uh, who obviously got battle tested as early as 2020 now, and him taking the next step, and a Clark Schmidt coming up through the system, and the depth, and I say all that with clearly the hopes of maintaining health for not just them, but for all other parties involved. And that's on top of evaluating you know, what's available at hand that's realistic. Um, that means available trade choices and what the swap cost happens to be, the available free agent market, the available minor league free agent market, and, and other aspects of our system that might play an play important role. And, and then really what's next year going to look like either? Uh, is it going to be a shortened 2021 season? Is our What's our minor league season going to look like? There's a lot of questions that yet have yet to be answered, but uh, but I do feel that every year, Joel, the the roster is different. Uh, just like we have free agency with a lot of quality talent that that is going into free agency, um, you know, do we have the uh, the ability to, to retain all? Should we retain all? Um, you know, uh, how that those questions get answered will will reflect a different roster, um, more likely than not, regardless. And so, um, we're constantly trying to evaluate you know, the strengths and weaknesses of the roster and 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 make sure that we're in a position to feel good to, by where we're going with it and uh, meaning as early as opening day of next year and and uh, and, and maintaining the health of, of whatever that roster looks like. And so um, we'll see. I mean, I, I, it's it's all a game plan and strategy. Do I think there's something fundamentally flawed with this roster? I think the roster that competed in postseason, I think the starting rotation was at risk um, and that needs to get, you know, improved upon. Uh, and some of the jeopardy and risk that that happened with was because of uh, some injuries that happened along the way that, you know, allowed us to or forced us to, to reconfigure and focus a different way. But, um, 
you know, that that's certainly the, an obvious area. You know, so when we walk into that, as I talked about the Tampa Bay Rays, they were they, they had a nice uh, top three that they threw at that they can throw at anybody right now uh, that are nice and healthy and, and primed, which is, you know, when you have Charlie Morton as your third starter, that's a pretty impressive lineup right there, uh, coupled with that great bullpen behind it. So with Glass now and Snell, it was a really impressive setup that was operating at, uh, at a high level at the time that uh, they entered postseason. And it's it's, you know, um, it's performing well for them as it should. And so, you know, my job is to try to get us to the point where, you know, some of the navigations to try and exploit our roster strengths, whatever they happen to be, uh, you know, or maybe those decisions could be different if we have some higher caliber talent, you know, that our manager, you know, uh, can deploy. And if not, you know, then we have to come up with a little bit of a mixing and matching to make it the best version of itself, like that game two strategy showed. Dave Lennon, go ahead. Hey, Cash. Uh, just looking back on the game two uh, Garcia Hap decision, is there anything that you guys regret uh, about that decision making process? And just specifically in light of leaning somebody like leaning on somebody like Hap, who afterward didn't sound like he was mentally on board with being used in that role? I, I'm not sure. I'll be honest. No, I don't think so. I mean, ultimately, you know, we we didn't ask Davey Garcia to do something he wasn't used to. He was asked to start, right? Uh, and we were not going to have a long rope with him. Uh, obviously, at this stage of his career, it doesn't mean he could not have pitched well, but we, again, trying to exploit the current roster going into that series, we felt this was the best strategy. We didn't ask Jay Happ to do something he wasn't used to doing. Um, and what do I mean by that? You know, I know he's a starter, but he's had 15 career postseason appearances in his entire career. You know how many starts he's had in the postseason? He's had four. So his whole postseason career is coming out of the pen typically, including last year uh, where in game six, you know, Chad Green against the ALCS uh, uh, knockout game with Houston, Chad Green started game six in the first inning for us. And then Hap came in and relieved and pitched three innings of relief of shutout baseball, if I remember right. And I think it was September 25th of last year against Tampa Bay as well, where we had an opener against Tampa Bay and then Hap came in and pitched five innings of one run ball against Tampa last year in September. And so he was given advance notice. Of course, he would like to have started. Um, it was a number of days that a conversation that I wasn't a part of, it was between our manager and our pitching coach and anybody else happened to be in on the field staff. I wasn't a part of that. Jay had a chance to absorb it, adjust it. He wasn't asked to do something that he wasn't used to doing, and he was given advance notice. Uh, he did tell our manager he was all in. He, I think he told you on his post-game press conference he was all in. But when you lose, you know, obviously then a lot of things happen. You, know, you get dissected, finger points, and stuff like that. But um, I don't – all I know is we tried to put Jay Happ in the best position he possibly could be in to find a way to navigate that – what I call that Swiss Army knife lineup, so that Kevin Cash would would take some right-handers out of that lineup. So when Hap came in, he had better lanes to try to navigate. Didn't work. You know, it didn't work. But it's something that we have deployed in the past. We'll continue to deploy, and it's not something that we haven't been deploying alone. You know, it's been happening in this current postseason by other clubs as well, and it's been happening as early as the past. Uh, and I think last year Jay pitched out of the bullpen three times for us uh, in the postseason. So. I thought that this was a sound strategy that ultimately by performance just didn't work out. Just like then when then we, kept, then we collapse into game three where we have Tanaka, who's our game two start, our, our number two starter at this stage, and hoping that would work out. Didn't work out. You know, the performance wasn't there. And then, uh, and then Monty stepped up in game four and uh, along with the bullpen and got us into a game five to get, turn the ball over to, to, to Cole. And, and uh, we got, you know, knocked out with a, you know, in a very tightly, contested ball game uh, but the, sad, the the strategy itself I felt was stra uh, was very sound uh, there was you know, a lot of information provided for how to navigate this uh, unique team that we're playing which was the Tampa Bay Rays because you don't see a team like this with the capabilities and the flexibility that they actually have in this particular roster and and uh, you know, provided a number of different ways to climb that mountain. Uh, and then Aaron Boone dissected it with his staff and, and ultimately plotted a course. A course I, I certainly support. Um, but it didn't work out. Um, but 
ultimately all we're doing was matchup baseball and trying to find a way to get the best matchups to allow our players that we currently have the best opportunity to have success. That's the, the greatest gift a manager can do, which is put their position, their players in the best position possible to succeed. And then, you know, it's your, it's that player against their player on each individual pitcher hitter matchup competition. And, you know, may the best person win, may the best team win. And that's ultimately what happened. In the end, the best team won. Um, but I thought that, for instance, in Jay Happ's case, he was put in a better position to try to have success than he would have been if he started that game, uh, despite his acknowledging that he didn't want to do, he'd rather have started. But Gary Sanchez would have rather started than Higashioka. Ultimately, you're trying to find the best decisions possible, just like Clint Frazier would have preferred to start game one in Cleveland instead of Brett Gardner, you know. All these tough decisions have to get made by somebody, and our manager, uh, Aaron Boone, is willing to make those tough decisions and then live with the consequences, and therefore, we as an organization live with the consequences because we are all, we are all connected and we're all in, and we're committed ultimately to, to uh, you know, the decisions once a, pro a sound process is executed. And uh, as long, the only thing I can demand and ask for in the chair I sit is, is to make sure that you have well thought out decisions, make sure you spend the time uh, and have good reasonings behind them. And, uh, and that's it. And I feel like that all took place here. And um, it does feel like a little bit that we're not supposed to utilize, um, you know, the same processes that all these other successful teams are utilizing too. And, and it's the same processes have got us here on a year in and year out basis. Um, ultimately, I think if I can get better players, you know, a, a deeper roster, uh, which is on me, you know, um, I think we have a chance to have, you know, maybe a better outcome in, in some of these uh, matchups. So, so I'm sorry that, for instance, from my position, that Aaron Boone had to be in a position to try to find ways to maximize, you know, a back of the rotation, whether it's a, a really young uh, starter in Debbie Garcia that we really have high dreams for and think he has a chance to be really good or Jay Happ in the current, you know, uh, setup he happens to be in at the stage of his career and, and try to find a way to match those guys up in the proper setting in that particular series. If I obviously had somehow uh, either maintained health of current starters that were gone or acquired other starters that I could plug and play in there that might have been, you know, then those type of decisions don't have to be made. Uh, but because of the roster, the way it was configured, which is my responsibility, not his, you know, he was forced to try to come up with different game plans and, and be open-minded to how to best navigate it. And uh, it didn't work out. Um, but, you know, hopefully in the future, we'll be in a better position than we are right now. Thanks.